This is CBN News Watch. Thanks for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Lori Johnson. Florida Senator Marco Rubio says that Broward County officials and Democrats are trying to steal victories from Republicans in the state. He says there's no excuse for them to still be counting votes days after the election, and they are violating Florida voting laws. He also tweeted, what's happening in Broward County isn't a recount. As Democratic lawyers said, we're doing this not just because it's automatic, but we're doing it to win. He also pointed out that even Bay County, hit by a Cat 4 hurricane, managed to count votes and submit timely results. Outgoing Florida Republican Governor Rick Scott filed a lawsuit over it against Broward and Palm Beach counties, accusing them of rampant fraud in his Senate race. And they are illegally refusing to allow official party representatives into the ballot counting area and forcing people to stand behind a glass wall with limited visibility and no ability to hear what is going on. This is a clear violation of Florida law. This action comes as reports on new ballots show Scott's lead over incumbent Democratic Senator Bill Nelson narrowing. Scott said he will not sit by while unethical liberals try to steal this election. The Broward County vote could make the tight race between Scott and Nelson even tighter. The county's election supervisor, Brenda Snipes, is under scrutiny and being questioned after reporters by reporters after not disclosing the number of ballots that have yet to be counted and submitting timely reporting of vote counts. Despite being confronted by reporters, she refused to provide details. A 2016, in 2016, a judge ruled Snipes violated federal election law when she destroyed ballots from a race connected to an outstanding lawsuit against her office. Former Attorney General Jeff Sessions is barely out the door and already pressure is mounting for the acting Attorney General to recuse himself in the Russia investigation. This, as we're learning, the Russia investigation may soon be over. Robert Mueller is reportedly writing his final report on his Russia investigation that's been a distraction for the Trump administration. The president himself is expected to send written answers to questions from Mueller by the end of the month. With Sessions gone, Acting Attorney General Matt Whitaker is assuming control of the investigation, taking over for Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein. But Democrats are calling on Whitaker to recuse himself because of comments he's made about the investigation before he worked at the Justice Department. The biggest challenge for him is really going to be that, that the knives are out from, from Democrats. I mean, they are going to go after him. And you're seeing it already. As soon as, you know, as soon as that announcement was made, they started calling for his recusal. Should they he? want to investigate. No, I don't. I mean, I think there's no reason to recuse. What? Because, okay. you know, he has, a, he has an impression of what the Mueller investigation should look like that is different from what Senate and House Democrats I believe. Look, it's a Department of Justice investigation. It's not a congressional investigation. He's the acting attorney general. One of the names reportedly on the short list to replace Sessions is former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. Christie is a longtime friend and supporter of the president. He endorsed Trump after dropping out of the 2016 election and helped oversee the transition after his victory. Christie also served as a U.S. district attorney in New Jersey from 2002 to 2008. Others said to be in consideration for the attorney general's post are Trump attorney and former New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani and Florida AG Pam Bondi. The Supreme Court says 85-year-old Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg is home after being released from the hospital. She was admitted after falling in her office and fracturing three ribs. The court said Ginsburg was released Friday. Supreme Court spokesman Kathy Arberg says she's doing well and working from home. Ginsburg broke two ribs in a fall in 2012. She also had two prior bouts with cancer and had a stent implanted to open a blocked artery in 2014. The president of the largest Latino evangelical organization says immigration reform is possible in the new Congress and has a plan to get there. Reverend Samuel Rodriguez told CBN News Thursday that he's worked with both House Leader Nancy Pelosi and the president on the issue and believes they could make a deal. 
What would pave the way, he says, is taking citizenship off the table and giving the millions of undocumented immigrants here a legal status that would not include voting rights. The great anxiety is that Republicans believe that we are legalizing 11 to 12 million potential Democratic voters. That's the great fear. That's the elephant in the room that no one wants to talk about. It's about voter turnout and voters in the upcoming 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And if we remove that from their anxiety table, we can make a deal. Rodriguez also condemned a reported plan for the president to take executive action on immigrants seeking asylum, saying it's best to go through Congress. The Trump administration has been barred from ending the program known as DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. DACA is the Obama-era program that protects young, undocumented immigrants who came to the country as children from being deported. The federal appeals court ruling this week means the DACA issue will likely be decided by the Supreme Court, a move the president calls good news. Coming up, the world was watching election 2018 closely, especially in the Middle East. Reaction to the outcome from the Holy Land when we return. Not only were Americans closely watching the midterms, so were others around the world. As Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem, Israelis were also watching. Head out to Jerusalem's open-air market, Mahane Yehuda, and you can find that reflected among Israelis talking about the midterms. I'm sure Israelis as a whole, probably if a poll were to be done, Israelis as a whole would probably be more in favor of the GOP doing well uh, in these elections. I think the Democrats are terrible for Israel. Why? Why? Uh, they've taken a very hard left turn and their policies are not pro-Israel. You can safely say, and I've been polling this since the elections, the presidential elections, Israelis love Trump. And that it's only gained in, he's only gained in popularity here. And there are a number of reasons, both his personality, he's very blunt, and the way that he has defended Israel in the United Nations and really shaken up the United Nations with Ambassador Haley and with the policies, that's music to Israeli ears. Holster Mitchell Barak says Israelis favor certain candidates. They seem to want candidates that are more pro-Israel. Uh, that tends to be Republicans. That tends to be the uh, candidates from the evangelical community, from the South. The question is, will Congress, uh, beginning January 2019, will Congress provide tailwind or headwind to the president's national security uh, policy. Ambassador Yoram Ettinger served as Israel's liaison to the U.S. Congress and knows the importance of these elections for the House, Senate, and Israel. We should never underestimate the power of the legislature. The legislature can provide very, very intense headwind to American presidents, uh, which would transform an American president into a very weak personality in global uh, politics. I trust that reflecting the majority of the American population, the coming Congress beginning January 2019 will be as supportive of enhanced U.S.-Israel relations. Whatever the outcome of the elections, the results will have an effect beyond the borders of the U.S. to Israel, the Middle East, and beyond. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Political divisions are growing wider across America, and one author says it's giving birth to a new age of outrage. In his new book, Ed Stetzer encourages Christians to bring their best when the world is at its worst. Signs of incivility and outrage abound. From our nation's capital, where protesters, angry over the Kavanaugh confirmation process, jammed Senate hallways and interrupted CBN News' coverage of the demonstrations. Well, today has been one of the rowdiest days during the hearing, both inside the hearing room and outside. The hearing began with the first hour, was just very intense between the senators. To college campuses, where last year, rioters virtually took over Berkeley because they wanted to stop a commentator from the conservative Breitbart website from speaking on campus. It seems that we're in a time when people are increasingly at odds with one another, and it's, it's, a, it's an outrageous time with a lot of anger. 
In his new book, Christians in the Age of Outrage, speaker and author Ed Stetzer points out our country's deep divisions, hoping the church can bring about healing. But before that can happen, he says the church must focus on itself. I think one of the things that has been important to note in the last few years is that that sometimes the poly- political divisions has actually gotten into the church in a way that maybe it hasn't in the past. Stetzer says Christians can counter the growing outrage we see in our culture today simply by exercising greater spiritual discipline. My desire is we might act and love and listen and speak more like Jesus would in these situations. Stetzer, who is also the Billy Graham Distinguished Chair of Church, Mission and Evangelism at Wheaton College and Executive Director of the Billy Graham Center, says social media is a big part of the problem. He says Christians can hurt their witness by not properly engaging debates on hot topic issues such as gay marriage or politics. He offers a roadmap to navigating online conversations. We can be in an evangelical echo chamber where everyone sort of thinks like we do and then we're shocked to find out people have a different worldview and they do. And we actually found in our research that evangelicals are very likely to mute people or block people who disagree with them. And so you're never hearing different views so we have almost an undiscipled approach to social media that's, that's alienating our neighbors and building sometimes even divisions between Christians. And what we're calling for in Christians of the Age of Outrage is a change to that, a more thoughtful, biblical, spirit-filled approach that ultimately engages culture more effectively. He goes on to encourage evangelical Christians to model the message of the gospel. And so the question is, we have to make choices. How do we speak up for what's right? But also, how do we show and share the love of Jesus in the midst of the brokenness? And I think our research shows that people are saying, we've got to see a shift in the way we ultimately engage culture. The division is not helping anybody in the long term, harming the witness of the gospel. He says the best way to do that is through proper discipleship. I actually used to listen to a uh, political show, but I found that I couldn't pray for the president at the time and listen to that person because I got so riled up. And so what I had to do is, in my own discipleship, through spiritual discipline, I had to say, that's shaping me in a way that leads me away from what actually the Bible calls me to do. So I quit listening to that program, kept praying for that president, kept speaking up about things that mattered to me, but I was more discipled by my Bible and in the promptings of the Holy Spirit than I was by the radio program, or today it might be the cable news program that I'm watching. Meanwhile, in this current culture, Stetzer challenges Christians to intentionally live in a way that makes the gospel more appealing. I don't know that Christians can solve all the outrage issues. I think the culture has just gone, it's turned up the volume to 11, and it's just going all in on the outrage. So what I would say is, we need to show a counterculture message. The gospel's always been countercultural, right? It's always shown a different way. And when the world's running this way, the, the, the scriptures teach a different way. Jesus calls us to a better way. So I think the better way is not to join in and turn up the outrage volume, but instead to enter in on mission. Charlene Aaron, CBN News, Wheaton, Illinois. Still ahead, Restoring Tomorrow, a new film out in limited release with an important topic for America. Evangelist Anne Graham Lotz is turning her battle with cancer into an opportunity to continue her father's legacy and preach the gospel. Lotz posted a heartfelt tribute to her late father, Billy Graham, on her website this week, celebrating what would have been his 100th birthday. She said, Daddy's message is God's message, a message of hope for the future through Christ. It's a message that is especially real for Lotz after she was diagnosed with breast cancer in August. She had one successful surgery, but will have to endure 18 weeks of chemotherapy. Lotz praises God for sustaining her through her cancer cancer battle and says she has no fear of death. A doctor who treats hundreds of patients each week for free and another milestone for a popular Christian artist. Here's CBN's Jessica Chaco and Faithwire's Dan Andros with these trending stories. Christian singer Lauren Daigle made headlines again, performing on The Tonight Show. Her performance comes a week after singing on The Ellen DeGeneres Show, for which she faced some criticism. Dan, why the pushback? Why has she received so much criticism? 
Yeah, well, unfortunately, some people are responding on on social media and in different places where they can comment, just saying that she, you know, probably shouldn't have got on the show, and they're kind of basing that on the fact of Ellen's sort of positions on you know sexual orientation and and issues of that nature, and uh, some perceive that as her kind of not being friendly to the Christian worldview, and so therefore Lauren shouldn't have gone on, but. Really, the overwhelming response in light of those sorts of criticisms has been to applaud Lauren for going on and being a light. I mean, because the reality is millions of people are seeing uh, what Lauren's songs are all about. And of course, she's pointing people to the gospel. And so uh, most are viewing this as an overwhelming positive uh, that a, that a Christian like Lauren Daigle is getting out there in front of lots of people. Well, to watch Lauren's full performance, visit our Faith, Faith Wire page on Facebook. Well, next up, you may know him as the actor from movies like War Room and Courageous, but what you might not know about T.C. Stallings are his requirements before accepting a movie role. Dan, tell us about this. This is a fascinating story. Yeah, this is great. And I'll give you a quick little bit of background to get to what he does before he accepts a movie role, because it's really fantastic. So he was an aspiring professional football player, and he was working his way up uh, trying to get to the NFL through some of the lower professional leagues. And he was on his way up when he went to see the movie Fireproof. And uh, he was just jolted awake when he saw that movie. And he just really felt this call from God to go into acting. And so he prayed and prayed about it because he's like, I did. he was very moved emotionally by the, by the movie. And he didn't want to just say, oh, oh, this is my emotions talking. So he prayed and prayed about it. And, uh, and so the doors just opened for him. And so he really felt like this was God opening that door. And so now to honor God, uh, with the direction he's given him in his life and his career path, uh, he will not take a role if he feels like there is no easy way for him to point people back to God, uh, th you know, through the movie or the role he's playing in the movie. And so he will refuse it unless he can easily do that. That's amazing. It's incredible to see someone in Hollywood stand by their convictions so strongly. Well, thanks, Dan. And don't forget to check out faithwire.com for more inspirational stories. Back to you. Thanks, Jessica. And we'll be right back. Stay tuned. In Japan, Christianity is a minority faith and the church is very small. CBN Superbook is now in its second month on air in Japan and gaining popularity. Recently, the program took center stage at a large evangelistic event for kids and their families. Lucille Toulousen brings us this report from Tokyo. This is known as the Joy Joy Festival. It's Japan's largest annual evangelistic event, organized by 88 churches and the Word of Life Press Ministries, which is Superbook's ministry partner here. 2,000 kids and their families attended, and half of them are not part of any church. Churchgoers grabbed this opportunity to invite non-Christians to the concert, not only for entertainment, but to hear the good news about God's love. A special attraction this year was Superbook's Gizmo, or Robic, as he is known in Japan. The audience got even more excited when they received Superbook DVD sets. Gizmo is very happy meeting new friends here at the Joy Joy Festival, where Superbook has also participated. This is a great way to promote Superbook that now airs on national television here in Japan. John Tan, CBN Regional Director for Japan, describes the airing of Superbook as a miracle and a great favor from God. There was a difficulty to get uh, religious or Christian material on air. But seeing Superbook, uh, the quality of animation, and it helps children, so then they've allowed us to be on air. In addition to watching Superbook on television, churches are using the animated Bible series as part of their Sunday school curriculum. One of the big issues for the youth is they don't have hope. They don't know what to do with the future. But we know the church has the real hope in Christ. The lesson I learned from Superbook is to put Jesus first in everything I do. I love the part of the resurrection after Jesus died on the cross. Because Jesus is the one who forgave our sins and died on the cross. I invite my friends to our home to watch Superbook. I hope they tell their mothers about Superbook so they can get to know Jesus. 
Lucille Talusan, CBN News, Tokyo. You can find more of our exclusive coverage about the issues you care most about at CBNNews.com. And tell us what you think about the stories you've seen right here. You can do that by emailing us at newswatch at cbn.com or talk to us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We hope you'll join us again next time. I'm Lori Johnson. Have a great day.